to our shop in a moment. Um, but, but let's thank them for putting the program together. Um, also, a thank you to the Institute for Business and Social Impact for their support of the program uh, throughout the semester. I want to say a few words about um, logistics before we start. So um, we do try to keep the auditorium clean, so please don't bring food and coffee and tea in here. Uh, water's fine, but uh, if you can finish those other things outside, we'd be grateful. Um, you've discovered those tea and coffee and snacks. They'll be there uh, at this time of day, in the morning and in the afternoon. Uh, you're on your own for lunches, um, but there is a list of, of places to go uh, outside on the table. Uh, there are also lockers available for use at lunchtime on the far side of the building uh, with a pin code to, to uh, get into those uh, if you want to leave your stuff. Um, hopefully you've discovered Wi-Fi covers is the, the open one and, and you can also use Edge Your Own if, if uh, your institution supports authentication that way. Um, the talks are all going to be live streamed and uh, uh, archived on the website and on YouTube. Um, uh, our videographer is Darren. Back in the room here, he'll be helping with hooking up computers um, and getting the speakers to sign their waiver forms. Um, also, uh, our event coordinator, Jesse Gill, at the back of the room. A big thank you to, to Jesse for always working on a local organisation to make it <laughs> He took over from Karma Welji, who is also around this morning for that for that uh, uh, transition and did a lot of the, a lot of work for this workshop. Um, but do feel free to ask Jesse or Carl uh, if you have any questions about logistics. All right, so I'll hand over to Arthur. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, I'm very excited about the topic. Uh, there are about ten speakers that I know personally, and the other ten, the other half of the program, I haven't met, so it'll be my first chance to get to meet all of you. Uh, I think the topic really brings computer scientists, economists, philosophers, uh, <coughs> lawyers together, and so I'm really hoping for there to be sort of uh, active discussion. So feel free to interrupt our first speaker, which will be Toby. Hi, and thanks for the organizers for inviting me here. I'm always extremely happy to be back in, in this building in particular, uh, after, especially after spending a whole semester here uh, last year. Um, uh, the title that was put on the schedule, uh, I did not give it, uh, but it's not a complete miss. Um, I will talk about things related to uh, law and computer science, but in a much more restricted sense. I don't understand about the law. It's a very uh, wide uh, topic, and I also understand computer science unlimited. Um, so uh, I'll focus on the relationship between law and computer science in the context of privacy. And uh, I will tell about this project, which is an ongoing project. Uh, we have some initial results that I will mention here. Uh, but this has been running for the last about six years, uh, beginning at the time I was at Harvard and continuing now when I'm in uh, Georgetown University. And it's a collaboration where, uh, with the participation of computer scientists and uh, legal scholars and social scientists. And Please uh, feel free to stop me with questions. Probably I will not know the answers. Uh, I have to say, again, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. So uh, 
I need in this kind of work to, uh, to collaborate with legal scholars and uh, because they complement my understanding and hopefully I complement their understanding so that we can hopefully do something new which is uh, in, in, in between the, the disciplines and this is what I want to talk about today. So the privacy problem, uh, um, just for motivation, uh, we collect a lot of personal data, companies do that, governments do that, various institutions do that, uh, but this is not just for the mere uh, collection, but also to make use of this data. So in the most abstract way, we put that data into some computation or analysis, uh, sometimes this is referred to a mechanism, and we get an outcome, and this outcome then is hopefully useful for scientific findings or policy making or national security and so on. And the privacy question is whether we can do this, we can, whether we can use the data, uh, compute interesting functions of the data sets, um, but considering the fact that this data uh, contains sensitive personal information, can we do that while protecting privacy? Okay. And the focus that I want to have today is what the heck does this mean while protecting individual privacy? Okay. Now, trying to answer this question, we can look at what we currently have in the literature, and I will bring uh, trials to answer the question, what is privacy? What does it mean to protect privacy? coming both from the technical literature, the computer science literature, and from the legal literature. So in the te technical literature, we see what I would call technical privacy concepts, and two examples are anonymity and differential privacy. And I will give a very brief introduction to, two, to the two uh, concepts uh, in a few minutes. And, but when you look at them, these are concepts that attempt to give, uh, to offer some general privacy protection. Usually they are not considered in a specific context. They are not devised to uh, answer privacy issues of a specific context, but much more generally. In principle, you could apply differential privacy or anonymity in any context where individual data is being collected and analyzed. They use mathematical language. Not surprisingly, we come from a field that uses math as the language of communication and description of, of, of what we do. And furthermore, as a language that we use to argue about these concepts. It seeks to provide provable privacy guarantees uh, and, and manages to do that to some extent. And on the other hand, when we look at the legal literature, we see also uh, many uh, legal privacy concepts. You will not see anonymity and differential privacy directly there. These appear in, uh, in legal texts and in particular in regulations and laws that some of them are directly talking about privacy. In some of them, privacy is part of the requirements that this document is, uh, um, that these documents are describing. For instance, FERPA, and HIPAA are two US regulations, two of the very many regulations in the US that touch on uh, privacy of individual information. FERPA uh, is about uh, educational uh, records. HIPAA is not a legal standard of privacy, but it does ha have a, 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 a part where it, it refers to privacy. This is about medical information. And we all heard about, I guess, about the DGPR, that's an EU uh, standard that was enacted in, in May last year, uh, this, which is more general. This is not now uh, um, uh, FERPA and HIPAA are very context, uh, uh, are about very specific contexts, like educational records or medical records, where the GDPR at least in its name, it's a general data protection regulation. And I'll try to uh, talk about the GDPR a little later. And when you look in this uh, document, you see a plethora of uh, legal privacy concepts, such as PII, personal uh, identifiable information, 
uh, an idea that you could de-identify or anonymize data, um, a notion of linkability, singling out, risk, inference risks, opt out, consent, and a few more uh, um, uh, concepts like that that make up like the soup from which these documents are choosing and, 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 and these are the concepts that they use in order to define their privacy requirements. I, I should say that, um, okay, before I say that, the, the definition of these concepts is uh, not formal or accurate or rigorous from a mathematical point of view. And this is often very painful when people like me are looking at this, when computer scientists are looking at this and trying to get the rigor here and translate that into mathematical language. And it is sometimes or often uh, frustrating. But nevertheless, this is what we have to deal with. It's often sector-based, at least in the US. Uh, it's not general. Uh, it leaves, the definitions leave significant gray areas and uncertainty with respect to what exactly they capture. And many times the definitions include some extreme examples, like clearly if you uh, take uh, personal sensitive information and publish it in, 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 in the public, okay, this is not good. And clearly if you just maybe burn it, this is privacy preserving, but not good from a utility point of view. But what happens in the middle is uh, hard to, uh, it, it's hard to put the line of where exactly we consider uh, the, the, uh, the treatment of data pri uh, privacy preserving and when, when, uh, when uh, the treatment exceeds this boundary. And also sometimes these concepts are seem to be in uh, disagreement with what we currently understand scientifically about information or about privacy. And I should also say that um, these concepts that I uh, colored yellow here are sometimes, many times, redefined in the different documents and these definitions are not uh, 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 always consistent uh, between themselves. Because each of the regulations, especially when we talk about the sector-based regulation, uh, they care about some other things and they emphasize other things and this can create some uh, mismatch between their uh, definitions of the same concept. So taking these two uh, parts of the puzzle, the best would be if we can just put them together because, uh, you know, um, more and more uh, data is being processed by uh, computer systems, so these uh, technical privacy concepts that we use hopefully match the, uh, the, the legal uh, concepts. So hopefully we can very easily claim that the use of these or other concepts meets the requirements of the, um, of the, of the law. But trying to put them together, I found it quite hard to match these pieces. They don't fit together. And hence, maybe what we need is a new piece that will help to bridge between these legal and, and technical privacy concepts. And this is what I'll try to, uh, to talk about today. And hopefully, uh, I'll show you that we have some, uh, definitely there are, there are a lot of difficulties, but there are also some um, reasons for optimism, so, some, some results that we can actually, uh, or some, some examples, or a couple of examples, <laughs> where we can actually uh, contribute to this piece that, that is here in the middle. Okay. And then, as I said, this is an ongoing project. It began uh, at Harvard when I was in the Privacy Tools project there. I visited for a few years. And there we were worried that, so in the Privacy Tools project, we were um, building tools for social scientists to share sensitive information that they collect uh, throughout their uh, research with other scientists and we were worried and, and we were suggesting uh, before being worried we were suggesting the use of differentially private tools to uh, as, as a means for for helping this sharing and we were worried whether once we will actually start using this with real data 
whether this use of differentially private analysis actually complies with the legal uh, restrictions that, that there are in FERPA in particular with respect to um, uh, sensitive information and in FERPA with respect to educational records. That was a use case for us. And so we wanted to make rigorous claims that the use of differential privacy actually satisfies the legal requirements. But over time, the goal has been updated, and currently we're trying more broadly to understand how the legal and technical concepts of privacy, how these relate to each other, and bridge between the two languages. And bridging between the languages is not only in terms of defining the concepts, but also hopefully in terms of building ways to argue about privacy in, in, in arguments that hopefully make sense both from a legal and a technical point of view. So we want to compute the legal analysis, the technical analysis, in, uh, to, 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 to combine these in, in our arguments. So uh, some positive things said about this project. Uh, in, in the last four years, I, I meet more and more with legal scholars, and this is what's actually said about this project. Um, um, it's a total waste of time, and some lawyers would say I can easily lit litigate the use of differential privacy in court uh, by just making a claim that uh, this is the technology that currently uh, uh, scholars and experts agree is the best we have in order to, to, to provide privacy, and hence its use should be uh, legitimate from a legal point of view. But I want to say that this is not the point. I think, and, and the entire discussion today is not about differential privacy. I'm not trying to push differential privacy as a concept. What I'm trying to push is the idea that we need to find a way to bridge between concepts like differential privacy and the concepts that appear in the law. And we need to understand how to relate uh, to each other, not only with, <laughs> respect to legal concepts, but all, like to how we think about privacy uh, in, as a society. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that also in this audience or in this workshop there will be people coming from uh, ethics and philosophy to talk about uh, privacy. We need to understand how the way uh, we think about privacy normatively, uh, uh, how that interacts with the technical measures that we are giving in order to provide privacy. Okay. Otherwise, we're just doing something maybe arbitrary. And one could claim that it's an impossible task, and I would tend to agree, but nevertheless, I think that we don't have any, uh, any uh, option but to try to tackle it. And maybe we will never get there, but uh, hopefully with this kind of work, we will get closer to, to, to an ideal where we have this understanding and I also think that we need to do this with as much rigor as possible in order not to uh, make past mistakes. We have by now a litany of, um, I don't know how many years, probably a few decades, where we used uh, technology that was supposed to provide privacy but was shown not to provide privacy in, in any reasonable way although it was also easy to litigate that this technology, in court, that this technology <laughs> satisfies the legal requirements. Okay, so uh, this is what I'll try to do. Um, I cut this presentation for a much longer one, um, but, uh, and, and I made a lot of uh, compromises in, in, in doing that, but so uh, in particular, this part of the background related work is going to be very short, I think I have three or four slides, um, and then uh, I want to show one example, one use case of work of, of how we do, how we, how we tackle this question of, of uh, creating this, this bridging. Um, so for background related work, I will mention very briefly about these two technologies, anonymity and um, differential privacy, and then uh, the, the specific technical details are not going to be important for the talk, so, uh, but I, so don't worry about that. And then I will uh, review a few uh, works that try to do something in the, in the vein that, that I'm talking about. 
Okay. So what is chaonimity? This is a concept that was suggested by Latanya Sweeney and Samarati in um, around the year 2000. I guess if you do the average of these two papers. Um, and chaonimity actually was devised in order to answer a very specific kind of attack. In the year 2000, Latanya Sweeney showed that she could um, re-identify information that was de-identified, and, and that was real-life information from Massachusetts. And she actually managed to identify the medical records of the person who was then the um, governor of Massachusetts and put it in, 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 in an envelope and sent it to his, to his address. Um, and chaonimity was a way to, uh, a, 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 is a measure to avoid the specific kind of attack that uh, Sweeney developed then and, the, and the, that, she, that she managed to re-identify the, the information with. Okay. So in chaonimity, we can take a data set and we uh, use operations that we call suppression or generalization. The idea is that we erase information from the data. Okay? The data is the data of uh, personal records, and we will decide to suppress information or to generalize it. Generalizing means, uh, like, if there is an age, maybe we'll round it or we'll, we'll back it, it within, like, uh, uh, multiple of fives or, or, or something like that. And the goal is that in, if in the original data set, uh, every individual would usually be uh, different, will have a different uh, a row in the data set, and hence could be identified by, by that row. In anonymity, we'll require that after the suppression and generalization, every uh, row that, that appears in the outcome will appear at least k times. Let me give you an, an example. Um, uh, let's say this is a fake uh, medical record, of course, and you, you can see that um, if you use zip, age, and sex, you could use them to identify people, and if you say you live in zip code 23456 and your uh, you know, um, 55 year old neighbor who happens to be a female, you know that you went to this hospital, then you know that she had a heart uh, condition. Okay? Um, so uh, you can actually identify her role in, in this data set. Now, with, if we too anonymize the data, and here I suppressed uh, uh, some of the data and, and uh, some of the information and generalized some of the information. For instance, in the age, you see that this person is in his 30s. Okay? But now, every row appears, if you will check this, every row appears twice in the data set. In chaonimity, every row will appear k times, and hence, there is a claim one cannot use this potentially identifying information on the left to identify a person and, and identify which row belongs to a person. Okay? Um, so, for instance, uh, now, when this neighbor that comes from zip code 23456, because age and sex were suppressed, now maybe I couldn't tell whether uh, this person had a heart attack or a viral disease. Okay? But notice that we can, this does not always happen. For instance, in this case, the disease is the same regardless of, I cannot tell which row belongs to, the, to which person, but they have the same sensitive information. So maybe they are not protected so well. And indeed, people have noted that and suggested variants of chaonimity, which are called L-diversity. L-diversity will make sure that on the right hand, uh, we will not have something like uh, here in the two persons having the same disease, the closeness, and so on. But they are all variants of chaonimity. And chaonimity is quite a popular measure. Uh, the number of papers written about chaonimity are quite, is quite huge. Um, and um, has been used in, in with, with a lot of real, real life data. The second uh, technology I want to mention briefly is differential priv privacy. This is a measure that was suggested by Cynthia Walk, Frank Mascheri, Adam Smith, and myself in 2006. 
And the best way maybe to see this, it's a definition of privacy. It's not a particular technique. And the definition requires the following. In the real world, data is fed into an analysis and we see an outcome. And I'm worried in the real world because my data is part of this data. My sensitive information is there. And then there is a chance that through the analysis, some information about me would be leaked, right? So ideally, I would want to see the same analysis happen because I like science or because I think this is an analysis that's important for national security or whatever. But I would feel better if my data was not included in the analysis because then uh, the, the analysis could not leak it, in, uh, could not leak anything about me directly about me uh, into the outcome. Okay. Could not leak any information that is specific to me into the outcome. And differential privacy is a mathematical definition that formalizes this desiderata, not only for me, but for any participant in the data set, okay? And this is formalized uh, by saying that we wanted that the real world outcome would be very similar to the ideal world outcome. And because in the ideal world outcome, my specific information could not be leaked, so would be the case in the real world outcome, okay? This is formulated mathematically, and there is a measure of similarity between these outcomes, and it is, uh, the, the, the type of similarity is chosen carefully so that to make sure that chances of every bad event, like the probability that I will not be issued uh, insurance or that I will not be accepted to, uh, to a school or that I would be arrested, the chances of every such event would be similar um, in my ideal world and in the real world. Okay, and I will not get into the math of how actually to do that. Okay. But what differential privacy captures is the intuition that uh, things could be learned about me because I'm similar to other people. I'm human. So everything that you learn about humans uh, on, on, on the bottom, uh, on the top, on the bottom, okay, is also about me. It's not that no information about me is learned in this outcome, but information that is specific to me is omitted there and hence cannot be learned about me. Okay. And because this happens in my ideal world, this will also, if, if, if the analysis is differentially private, this will also happen in the real world. Now, some related work that combines between, um, tries to, to bridge between legal or, or, or normative concepts and technical concepts. And maybe the first one to mention is the work by Helen Nisselbaum, who's unfortunately not here, but she's one of the organizers, I understand, uh, which is a framework for reasoning about privacy. And the reasoning is about uh, norms uh, that, that speak about Information flows between contexts. A context is like your, like your home or your uh, doctor's office and so on. And norms talk about how information could flow between uh, different contexts. And differential privacy, one, one important observation that Helen Smell made is that the, the same, the, the, the revealing of a piece of information would be considered privacy preserving in one context and not in another context. For instance, when you go to your banker, uh, if your banker would, for some reason, know something about your medical condition, that may uh, feel as breaching your privacy, whereas if that would happen when you go to, uh, to your doctor, the, that would be uh, acceptable. Actually, this is what you want to happen. Um, so in different contexts, different information could be revealed and uh, contextual integrity is a framework for reasoning about privacy in such a complex world. And there's been work to trying to formalizing uh, in logic uh, some aspects of contextual integrity okay. and to specify and reason uh, rigorously about norms of transitions of personal information in the context of medical data. Another project that is currently happening at Harvard is uh, Robot Lawyers, um, which uh, I think is a fascinating project. Um, 
where the idea here is to uh, learn about a data set and automatically generate a license for researchers who download this data set from a social science data repository. This is also part of Harvard's privacy tools project. And what's common to these two that is that they use logic as, 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 as the underlying language. But then in this logic, they refer to predicates, like predicates are functions to, that evaluate to true or false. Okay, and here's the one example from the first work. Uh, this is a predicate, contains MPT. This would evaluate to true if message M is about an individual P and it contains an attribute T. Okay, and similarly, uh, in the Robot Lawyers project, they have um, predicates like FERPA identifiable and DS is a data set, which would evaluate to true if the data set D if the data set is identifiable according to FERPA. But what both uh, projects don't do is to define these concepts, uh, uh, these uh, predicates mathematically. So um, making a decision of whether a message M actually includes information about an individual P and whether this is uh, uh, actually implies something about an, an attribute T, this is a very, very tricky, if not impossible uh, task. Okay. And similarly, uh, from the legal description in FERPA, I think it's quite hard to make a determination whether a data set is identifiable according to that standard. Now, in some work we did at Harvard, we tried to bridge some of this difference. In particular, we uh, looked at FERPA and we extracted a very conservative mathematical definition of privacy from FERPA, which conservative here means that probably our definition is much, much uh, more restrictive than what the FERPA regulator meant. Okay? Uh, so it's kind of we were taking the, the definition to an extreme. Uh, there were many reasons for doing that that I will not be able to uh, describe now. But once we had this mathematical definition, which likely covers a lot more than what the regulator meant, we could also provide a mathematical, mathematical proof that differential privacy, the use of differential privacy satisfies this definition. And hence, uh, we believe this is a strong argument in favor of like a claim that the use of differential privacy could is is uh, uh, satisfies the requirements in FERPA for making a data set uh, not identifiable. Okay, and this in particular may be useful for understanding um, this predicate FERPA identifiable that I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, and I'm afraid I won't have time to say more about this project. Okay. So let me now get, yep. So, okay, um, the definition of differential privacy is kind of on its own looks desirable uh, because you have this uh, rather clean uh, ideal versus real world uh, comparison. You know, but the issue is that in fulfilling it, it's like exceedingly, I mean, it's a very strong definition. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but I find it interesting that here that you have a weaker definition potentially weaker definition that is extracted uh, as, uh, from uh, you know, some legal language somewhere, it isn't the question of, okay, fine, so maybe this is uh, another definition, maybe it's uh, less desirable, but at least it is maybe the spirit of FERPA. Should one try to say, like, okay, what can we come up with, like a broader set of tools that lets us do more uh, yeah. So, so, you, so you're absolutely right that differential privacy is a very strong requirement which limits the use that you can make out, out of data. And a lot of the research in differential privacy and like informal research in privacy is directed at understanding exactly what are the limits that you can, how much you can extract from a data set while maintaining a reasonable uh, sense of privacy. And we're very far from answering this. Um, the work we did here, the fact that we that because differential privacy is such a strong requirement, we could be extremely conservative in extracting that mathematical definition. And um, you wouldn't be surprised that even 
we, we did not directly push for differential privacy. We got something that is very close to differential privacy, in a sense equivalent to it. So uh, this will not, this, unfortunately, I would love this to, to be able to give us a definition that is still, still allowable by FERPA um, and weaker than differential privacy, so allows more in terms of, uh, but, but honestly, this, this is not the case. What I would love to see is others coming with uh, a similar analysis, taking very carefully, looking very carefully about the legal text and extracting uh, from it the, the hints where they, they, and where they are scattered all over the place in the, in the regulation itself and also in the guidance doc documents uh, to collect all these in order to make potentially a weaker definition, but justified by by the legal text, and then we could compare the definitions and, and ask ourselves whether the, the other one is something that we like, and hopefully some of these attempts will, will, will result in, in, in uh, definitions that would survive scrutiny. So um, this is exactly what I would love to see here. I don't think what we got is probably strong, a, a very strong definition, which means it's a definition that if you satisfy it, you satisfy FERPA, but it's not necessary, probably not necessary to satisfy it to satisfy FERPA. So we have an argument of sufficiency, but not of necessity here. And it will be interesting if, to see if we can uh, develop an argument that is closer to necessary and sufficient, or maybe something that is necessary to, to come from the other side, even without the sufficiency, so that we can, you know, close the gap. But, yeah, this is something I'd love to see, like if this group will develop that definition, I'm, I'm all for it. And, and by the way, this is also uh, about this, uh, this part of the uh, talk, uh, where I will tell about Morrison's work with Aloni Cohen, where we looked at a notion from the GDPR, the singling out, and uh, which I will uh, uh, give you the legal text in, in a few minutes. And we came up with a definition. We, uh, for a reason, we did not call our concept singling out. We call it with a different name, uh, predicate singling out, with the purpose that we understand that this may not completely reflect the, what, what the regulator meant. And we hope that others will come with other versions of singling out, again, justified mathematically and legally, so that we, comp we can compare these notions and decide which one we want to, to continue with. Okay, so let me, uh, how much time do I have still? 20 minutes. Good. Um, so let me now uh, delve into this. So the General Data Protection Regulation is currently uh, what many people see as uh, like a strong privacy regulation in the EU. Uh, the full title is written here. It's Regulation of the Protection of Natural Persons with regard to the processing of personal data and on the free movement of such data and repealing Directive 95, the Data Protective, uh, Protection Directive. So uh, in May uh, 2018, the uh, Data Protection Directive from 1995 was repealed and the GDPR came into effect. We all got these emails telling us that uh, we consent to whatever. Uh, and, and because we got these emails, we know that our privacy is protected much better now, right? Um, um, now, interestingly, we think, many people think about the GDPR as, as a privacy regulation, that word privacy appears there exactly zero times. Um, and so it's a data protection regulation. You could think the data protection is wider or, or, or narrower than privacy or, or has other rel relationship to privacy, but this is not directly about privacy. On the other hand, the, the free movement of information is, is, a, is a phrase that appears many times in regulation and also in the title. So just to think about that, uh, about what, what the emphasis is. Nevertheless, I think that GDPR is a good step uh, like in, in terms of, it, it's, it's probably better than the regulations we have in the US, in, in the US. Now the, 
uh, the concept of singling out. The GDPR begins with Article 1, which delineates the, the, the scope of the regulation. And they say, this regulation lays down rules relating to the protection of natural persons with regard to the processing of personal data. Okay, so if somebody holds personal data or processes personal data, then this regulation applies. And then in Article 4, they continue and, and explain what personal data is. They say personal data means any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. An identifiable natural person is one who can be identified directly or indirectly. Okay. And then uh, in another part of the document, in a recital, there is some explanation of what it means to identify uh, uh, a person. And they say to, to determine whether a natural person is identifiable, account should be taken of all the means reasonably likely to be used, such as singling out to identify the natural person directly or indirectly. Okay. So if we read this, um, if you can single out in the data, then that data is identifiable and hence uh, the GDPR applies. You have to, there are all these rules there that you have to comply with. What is a natural person versus synthetic person? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, it, it, I mean, it's a good question. I guess it's, it's a natural person versus an organization. That's my guess. But again, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I may be wrong about this. Yeah. Um, so uh, just a couple more things about this. A recital 26 like that appeared also in the data protection directive that was repealed by the GDPR with exactly the same text, except for the addition of the uh, example of singling out. Okay, so uh, somebody apparently thought that it is important to edit the original Rosalind 26 and add singling out as an example. Another thing is that there is no other example given there. So the, the ellipsis after singling out just omitting omission of text that, uh, that that is not relevant for the presentation, but it does not have an ex it does not mention another kind of threat to data. Okay, singling out is an example, uh, but we do understand that singling out may not be the only way to identify data because they say such as singling out. So it could be that other means for identifying data or, or for creating risk in data are also relevant and need to be, uh, and they could be considered reasonably likely to be used and hence need, need to be taken into account here. I will only speak about singling out today, trying to understand this uh, this uh, concept. Question. Okay. Totally not relevant for later, but since there was uh, sorry, I don't hear you. It's not related to the rest of the talk, but um, uh, does it apply to both alive and dead people? Uh, no. So the GDPR again. I I I'm, I don't want to answer the legal question. But, so take this with a grain of salt. But the GDPR, the, your, your rights terminate roughly when you when you die, like with respect to to your data. There, there, are, there are also other limitations, but, but a natural person has to be alive. Yeah. To the best of your understanding, then, it is fair game to like, violate privacy in all kinds of ways for like, dead people. Well, there are limitations, but, but, but they don't have the same protection as, as, as people who are alive. But again, take my answer with a grain of salt because I'm not a lawyer. Okay. Maybe the best thing I learned to say uh, by working with legal scholars is that I'm not a lawyer. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, okay. Um, and now uh, you you would think that I will find another recital, 727, that explain what singling out is, but unfortunately, this is the only occurrence of the of this pair of words in in, in the text. Okay. So I have to go elsewhere. And one place to go is, um, is the following. So um, the, data, the DPD, the Data Protection Directive, has set a, a working party. It's called the Article 29 Working Party. And this is a working party with a lot of experts. 
and they produced a lot of very useful um, uh, documents explaining concepts from the data protection directive. And in particular, they have a couple of documents that relate to the question of uh, identifying identifying individuals in data, okay, and risks that, that individuals may have in the data, and also examining the technologies that could be used to mitigate these risks. And what the Article 29 Working Party says, as regards indirectly identified or identifiable persons, so this is exactly the question that we're asking here, this category typically relates to the phenomenon of unique combinations, whether small or large in size. Okay, a name may itself not be necessary in all cases to identify an individual. This may happen when other identifiers are used to single someone out. So if, if the recommendations of this Article 29 Working Party also apply to the GDPR, and, and there is a question about that, I have to admit, uh, but if they apply, if this, then we understand that singling out does not mean that you actually can name a person, but maybe you can identify a person by uh, a, a combination of attributes. And furthermore, as I said, they, they examine a collection of, uh, of uh, technologies. And uh, for us, you see, they also look at two other kinds of risks, which I will not touch upon today. But for us, so for us, the left-hand side of this table is relevant, and in particular, they look at uh, K-anonymity, and with respect to K-anonymity, they answer the question, is singling out still a risk? They say, no, it's not. And similarly, L-diversity, which is a variant of K-anonymity. And with differential privacy, they say it, the answer is not conclusive here. I think that overall, by referring to singling out, the GDPR seems to, to put a higher bar on privacy than what is usually considered anonymized data. And I think that's good. Um, and you could ask yourself, why is it that they did that? And here are two answers that I made up. One is that singling out is a stepping stone towards re-identification. In most of the re-identification attacks, first, uh, they, they single out. And so I think it's, it makes sense to stop there and not, not to require full re-identification. But also because singling out can create other kinds of threats. In particular, it, it singling out it suffices in many cases for treating uh, different persons differently. <laughs> now, so now, we, this is our starting point, and we would like to understand or formalize mathematically what singling out means. And there has been one trial in a paper by Paul Francis and others uh, where they define singling out as isolation. They say you manage to single out in a data set if there is exactly one person that has these attributes. Okay. Let me give you an example. So let's say that this is uh, kind of a Netflix uh, uh, award data, data set. It's completely fake, uh, we made it up. Uh, we have here three persons uh, with the movies that they watch and rating and so on. And here are three isolation examples. For instance, there's only one row in this database uh, of a person who watched the movie The Sting. And then there's exactly one row of a person who watched Mulan between February 19th and March 10th. And there's exactly one row of a person that doesn't satisfy the other two conditions. So these are three ways to isolate in this data set, OK? And you could ask what single, uh, singling out is indeed isolation. So for that, let me put forward a simple, a simple model. Let's assume that the data set has n rows, and they are drawn from some underlying distribution, OK? So probability distribution D. And technically, I will assume that this is an IID uh, distribution. Uh, this is a restriction that we don't know how to get around. But so it may weaken our definition. Remember that. And then this data is put into some uh, mechanism or analysis. There is something that is published. And the adversary has access to the published information and outputs a predicate. The predicate is a description that evaluates to true or false, and this is a predicate on the possible values of the original data set, not y, but x. 
Okay? And now we could say the adversary's goal is given the published data to isolate in the data set X. So I'll put a predicate that matches exactly one row, one person in the data set X. And here's a definition attempt. We could say that the mechanism is secure against signaling out if no adversary manages to isolate except for very tiny probability, okay? Negligible probability. And we have good reasons to think that this actually coincides with what some of the regulators in Europe thought. The only problem that it's very easy to show that this is impossible to do, okay? So this is a, a big problem. And let me give you an example of why is that. Consider what we call a trivial adversary. So let's look at the adversary that does not get any information about the underlying data set, okay? Can such a, an adversary isolate in the data set? Can such an adversary isolate in a data set with non-legible probability? And unfortunately, the answer is yes, it's quite easy. If the adversary chooses a predicate, a description that matches a random one over n fraction of the universe, then a simple mathematical argument shows that the adversary manages to isolate not with a non-negligible uh, uh, probability, but with probability of 30, about 37%. Okay, very high probability. Um, and so the adversary can isolate without seeing anything about the data set and, and succeed with high probability, uh, this just kills the, the naive uh, definitional attempt. Now, you may be worried that the adversary knows to, needs to know too much about the underlying uh, distribution in order to do that, but luckily we have work from uh, uh, randomness extraction, and it suffices that this distribution has moderate uh, mean entropy, actually log n, uh, or the log n bits of, uh, uh, of entropy suffices, and then we can use the leftover hash lemma in order to, uh, in order to do this. Yeah. Well, you should sort of uh, address this with the mean entropy, but uh, the there has to be a limit to which rows you can look at, right? Because, for example, in your previous example, you had a row number. So I could just say, look at row number one. So obviously that column, sorry, there's certain columns that are not. Yeah, sorry. So I should have removed the, 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 the identifying by row number is illegal here. Because right, the so row number is not something that you take IID from a distribution. Yeah. That, that there's a, a low main entropy that, you know, like most rows <laughs> No, in typical databases, there would be a lot of mean entropy. In typical databases. Typical databases are interesting. What's that? Because we need to have high mean entropy. No, no, no. The, the row has to have high mean entropy. This one would not be interesting column. Why doesn't your same attack work? Suppose you have many columns, each of which have one random bit. Yeah, it would. Yeah, that would work. If that's your underlying distribution, that's a distribution where it's very easy to isolate. This is what allows you to isolate, not what prevents you from isolating. Yeah, yeah. So this attack, the trivial adversary exists as long as there is enough mean entropy in the underlying data set, and this does not have to be much mean entropy, only log n bits. So, so yeah. you are saying there is a privacy violation if I say that there is a woman who smokes and does this and that. So if there is such one woman existence <laughs> a violation, even though I, I, I don't know whether it exists or not, right? You don't know what? I mean, you don't really know there is such a person in the data sets. You have no proof of it. You just probably are good. So here in isolation, I don't require that you would know that you were right. But in many cases, once you can uh, isolate a person, checking whether that is actually a person in the data set, like you have a potential isolation, Checking whether such a person exists is not such a big deal. So I think it does make sense to say that if you manage to isolate with non negligible probability. But anyway, this, this definition is just don't, not attainable and we will try to fix it. Okay, so uh, this, this game with a trivial adversary. Uh, relied very heavily on my ability to, to uh, choose a predicate that has weight about 1 over n. Yes, you have another question? It's just, it is achievable, just not in nearly as many cases as you would want, right? I mean, suppose your database is like one big 
bit per row that says whether or not your salary is yeah. over hundred thousand right. dollars. Right. You can actually yeah. But how many databases do you know that have just that only one bit is collected about a person? Well you can pre process the database. No, no, you could. You could use canon immunization and just erase all the right. data, make every row the, the same. But is this something that you will actually yes. So if you manage to reduce the the, the mean entropy in the data below log n, then it may be that this data set is robust against, uh, uh, um, um, against uh, isolation. Maybe, this is not, of course, it's a necessary condition, not sufficient. But, um, but in most cases, your goal is to extract as much information as you can from the data set, not to, to, to erase most of the data. I say it's impossible. It's that you have to cripple your data set so badly that it's just basically you can't do anything. Yeah. And uh, I, this is why I would say it's impossible. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, so this trivial attack relied on an ability to, to, to pick on a predicate that has weight 1 over n. Maybe we can restrict the attacker to pick uh, uh, um, uh, um, a predicate with a different weight, okay, other than one over n. So, if uh, the predicate has a baseline w, uh, sorry, has a weight w, then a simple calculation, actually repeating the same calculation, shows that the trivial attacker then manages to isolate with this expression on the right. Don't don't worry too much about it because I have the table here. Which means that if the weight is around one over n, a constant over n, and then you get, you manage to uh, um, isolate with one over polynomial probability, or at the extreme, thirty-seven percent. But if you, if the, if we require that this, uh, um, that this uh, predicate will have negligible weight, then the baseline is negligible. So this is a, a case where there is a chance. That that the, the that the definition is meaningful, and similarly, if the weight is much higher than one over n. Okay. Um, so here's our definition simplified. Uh, this is security against predicate singling out, and again we called it predicate singling out and not singling out because we think there is room for others to come up with definitions to analyze this, and maybe come up with other definitions that we'll be able to compare. And we say that M is secure against predicate signaling out if no adversary can, with non-negligible probability, output a predicate that matches exactly one row in the data set, so it isolates. But also, this predicate has weight that is bounded away from 1 over N. Okay? And this would also work. Like, if the database is really restricted, then you, can is you cannot isolate, period. Okay? And I don't care about the, the weight. Um, now, given the definition, we can analyze its properties. And two properties we learned from the history of looking at uh, differential privacy that are important are the resilience to post-processing. So if, uh, if an attacker further processes the outcome of the, data, of the data set, that should not create a risk. Uh, the, the outcome of a mechanism, that should not create a risk. Yes? So in your bounded away, uh I mean, the n squared, if you go back to the previous table, so aren't those other two also, like the 1 over nc is bounded away from 1 over n, right? You're right. So we could parameterize it. I just, I just put negligible just for simplicity. I, I saved on some Greek letters in, on, on my slide. That's the only thing, yeah. So uh, we can analyze the properties of the definition. It's very easy to see that this definition is resilient to post-processing. And the second thing we would like to check is what it self-composes. What happens if we have two mechanisms, each by itself secure against uh, predicate signaling out? If we put them together as a single mechanism, is it still secure against predicate signaling out? And it turns out the answer is no. Uh, the, the definition does not self-compose, and the proof is quite simple. Look at the data set. So it has n values as here. And uh, the first mechanism that we will create uh, just uses the, n, the first n minus 1 rows of the mechanism 
and you need a little more juice there. But uh, essentially, it extracts a, a random secret from, from these guys. Okay? And we can prove that this, if you do it right, that this is secure against pred uh, predicate singling out. Okay? The second data mechanism does the same, okay? but uses the secret to encrypt the last row of the data set. Okay? Again, by itself, we can prove that it is secure against predicate signaling out. But if you put both of them together, then clearly one can isolate the last row of the data set, can decrypt uh, the, the outcome of the second, uh, of the second uh, mechanism. And if the data has uh, sufficient entropy, then this is uh, uh, violates the, the requirements. How does the predicate have access to rows one to n minus one when it's processing? The predicate does not have access to them. The predicate that the adversary has access to this. This is one case. That's the outcome of the first mechanism. Or to this. That's the outcome of the second mechanism. In both cases, it does not have access to the data set. But if the adversary has access to both of them, he learns the last the last row of the data set. I guess I'm just. So I guess maybe I'm missing what the predicate is. The predicate that the adversary would output is exactly what the x equals the, the, the x row of these two things. But the adversary supplies the predicate. Yeah. So the adversary already needs to know what s After is. seeing the outcome of the mechanism. So if we combine both mechanisms, the adversary sees both s and s, x or x, xn, and hence learns xn and can isolate. How does the adversary learn S? S is the outcome of the first mechanism. S, X, O, X, N is the... No, no, no. Again, the mechanism is just outputs something. Something that happens to be PSO secure. Yeah. So if we uh, combine these two mechanisms, we lose PSO security. And we also have an example where, which is more natural because you may say, uh, you know, we don't usually do extraction from the first, but we, but we can actually use just count mechanism, uh, mechanism that, that do counts. And each of them is secure against uh, predicate signal out. This is a little more than login mechanisms, but when we compose them together, then we lose the security against predicate signal out. And we think that this says a lot more than about our, our definition. But it says something about singling out because these are very natural mechanisms. These are mechanisms that produce very simple statistics about the data. Just count how many people have an attribute. Okay? So these, this attack is likely to hold not only against our definition, but probably against any reasonable definition of singling out. I think this is what uh, you were getting after, right? If you, instead of having one mechanism, if you, you know, produce several mechanisms which output just one bit, one bit, one bit, one bit. And you're saying that even with just simple counts which have output of log n bits, uh, with enough of them you can, you can still break the middle position. Yeah. Okay. So I want to conclude with two things. Uh, first, I want to go back to this question of what are the, these two technologies protect against predicate singling out and to think about what are the, the, the consequences of, of, of this statement. Okay? So we can prove that differential privacy protects against predicate singling out. Okay? I will not show the proof now, but the proof is via some connection. So it reveals something interesting about the relationship between singling out, predicate singling out, and the generalization properties of differential privacy which is a recent line of work beginning by this work, by the work at all in uh, uh, 2015. But, but it shows that, definitely shows that differential privacy protects against predicate single out, uh, this particular definition. With respect to anonymity, uh, the, the story is interesting because this is a technology that the Article 29 Working Party thought protects against singling out. And what we claim is it does not protect against predicate singling out, okay? So why, how does that happen? This is really simplified. 
uh, picture of, of, the, of, the, of the attack, think about a data set uh, like here with n rows and we apply three anonymization for in this example. So we get something that every row appears uh, three times or more. Okay, but usually it will appear three times because the, the key anonymizers try to squeeze as much information as they can, they can from the data. Okay, and because they try to, uh, so th this is just the requirement for key anonymity. Each uh, we can think about each of these rows as defining a predicate, and actually in in, in some of the literature it's exactly defined this way. And the predicate on the data itself has weight more than k over n, okay? But, and here are the predicates in this case. But, because anonymizer tries to uh, suppress as little as possible, as possible, they try to squeeze as much information as possible from the data, typically the weight of a predicate is going to be negligible. Okay? Now, if that is the case, we are just one step uh, behind actually forming an attack. How do we do that? Let's use the trivial attack here. But now instead of attacking a data set of size n, the trivial attacker will attack a data set of size k. So it needs to, to choose a predicate, I call it p trivial, with one weight 1 over k, roughly. Now, here's p trivial. Now, let's assume the attacker outputs the last predicate that, that he learns from the three anonymizer in conjunction with uh, uh, P uh, trivial. Definitely the weight of this uh, predicate is less than the weight of three of phi, hence it's tiny by our assumption. But this predicate manages to isolate with probability about 37% in this small uh, group, and hence, with probability about 37%, uh, the, the resulting um, predicate also isolates. So we get a predicate that isolates and has a tiny weight, and hence this contradicts security against predicates in giving out. Now, can we go back and ask what are this, this mathematical uh, game uh, has implications for uh, GDPR compliance. And we believe that, that yes, we want to be careful about that. Uh, first, the positive results, the fact that uh, differential privacy, can I still a few more minutes? OK, uh, but thanks for not, not finding me. The positive results, uh, we think, have restricted implications. First, the definition we had, I mentioned the fact that we, in the definition we, we simplify the game. We say that the data set is, is chosen IID. Okay, so maybe this definition is too weak with respect to what the GDPR regulators meant. Okay, and hence, if the definition is too weak, then the prevention of predicates in and out is necessary but not, may, may not be sufficient. Okay, so the fact that differential privacy satisfies uh, predicate this requirement. PSO security does not directly uh, uh, say that it satisfies the DG GDPR uh, requirements. And we need to do more research in order to convince ourselves that this is the case. But because the definition is kind of weakened, the negative results are, 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 are meaningful. Uh, we're, as I said, we restricted the scope. Uh, the attacker, or the data set is uh, chosen IID, and furthermore, the attacker has no auxiliary knowledge. Okay, so this strengthens the negative results, and we believe that this shows that anonymity probably does not, or li very likely, does not provide sufficient protection against signaling out. Okay, and and, and, and the proof that they showed that the, how the attacker works shows that actually why this is the case, in a sense. Anonymity provides the attacker with the most, with the hardest part, okay, that is needed in order to uh, to do the predicate signal out. Once the attacker has the outcome of the three of the anonymizer, just needs to also apply a trivial attacker, combine them together, and oops, we have uh, singled out in this dataset. Okay. Um, 
So back to this table, we believe that uh, if the Articles 29 working party will reconvene, that they would uh, uh, reconsider these uh, conclusions here. And let me summarize now uh, what we've seen. We began with a legal concept from the GDPR, and <coughs> we analyzed it um, uh, in order to uh, get a technical concept of, of sing uh, singling out, okay? And then this technical concept informed us back with respect to the legal concept and its consequences. In more detail, we began with a GDPR notion of singling out. From it, we developed the definition of uh, predicate singling out security. Now, in this world, in the mathematical world, uh, we could examine this definition and show that it is uh, resilient to, uh, to uh, post-processing, but it does not self-compose. And this also gave us some insight into the uh, notion of singling out in the GDPR because the, the, the attack that we have there is quite natural and probably holds with uh, respect to many reasonable definitions of singling out. So maybe this is an essential issue with this, this concept of singling out. Does not mean that it's a bad concept, but it means that by itself it's probably insufficient. One needs to add more requirements in order to get a reasonable uh, protection. Okay. Then we examined uh, uh, these two technologies. Canonization is not PSO secure, and we think this likely means that it does not prevent the GDPR style of singling out. And differential privacy is uh, PSO secure, but that only gave some evidence that differential privacy prevents uh, GDPR singling out, but this is not conclusive. If you want really to be careful about our conclusions. And I think. Uh, here are a list of some of the references for this talk. And Thank you. So I think it is collected, like maybe uh, purchase history or click history. Um, there's another uh, so distinguished uh, field that's time. It's time series data. And I wonder if uh, sort of acknowledging uh, or discussing explicitly not just identity but also time can give, give more refined definitions that uh, they will be more easily applicable or you know, because it wasn't really mentioned that uh, you know, like each person had well, like one record here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, th this is a very good question. So in in. I can only say what happens in differential privacy. Uh, in, in differential privacy, kind of you could. You would think about the record of a person as something that is accumulated over time, but the, the privacy rec exactly. But but and and the requirement, the privacy requirement, is with respect to a person's entire role. Whether it, never mind if it hasn't been written yet. Okay, and I think that's that's a careful and and, and right way to to act with respect to privacy over time. But it also limits what you can do with, with data that is collected over time. So it makes sense to search for uh, formalisms that take time explicit, into account explicitly, not implicitly as in differential privacy, and see whether you can get something that is more permissive. But to the best of my knowledge, we don't have anything like that currently. And also GDPR doesn't really like it talks about this kind of static databases uh, or like maybe it doesn't really go into such things. The, the GDPR, to my understanding, and again, I'm not a lawyer, uh, is, uh, does exactly what you say. It does not go into this level of details to, to distinguish between uh, data that is collected over time and, and otherwise in terms of what is, requirement, what is required in terms of uh, protection. Again, I'm talking about with respect to the concepts that I, I was looking at. It may be that, that there are provisions in the GDPR about data that, are, that is collected over time in terms of security and so on, but this is not, these are not areas that I was looking at uh, specifically. Yeah. Other questions?
Tim Hock? Uh, I think maybe why dating anonymity is satisfying the definition is the singling out can be also thought as given the data set and the set of the attributes can uh, uniquely identify someone. So I think some people assume that k equal to automatically satisfies single out definition. I, 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 yeah. Well, I, I cannot guess. What, what they meant, of course, but uh, I can say two things. One is, it sounds intuitive that anonymity protects against signaling out, and I, to the best of our knowledge from the documents we read, we did not see a careful analysis as we did, a mathematical analysis as we did with respect to the technology in the, in the documents written by the Article 29 Working Party. Um, what I'm worried about interpretation of the kinds that you're saying is that they are limited because um, canonymity is a criteria that works when you get a database and in a sense you, 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 you also output a data set just that you erase some of the data. But in many of the analysis, what you output is not another data set. It's, it's a statistic, it's a, it's a machine learning model. It's whatever the new thing is. And if you restrict yourself to say what happens with the input and output of the mechanism, assuming that it, uh, the, the output satisfies this, this format, then restricts the entire view to uh, a small collection of, of, of analysis or, 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 uh, or algorithms. And, and I think we need to think about it in a much more general way. Let's, um, let's take... Thank you.